Hello everyone, since the last video was running kind of long, I'm going to continue here talking about the different components of market structure. Hopefully you remember back when we talked about technology a few weeks ago. In economics, when we say technology, we simply mean the means in which inputs are made into outputs. It really doesn't have to be anything high tech, it's just the means in which we make our output. You recall that we use production functions to describe technology in a mathematical way, and those production functions are going to tell us a lot about how a firm behaves. We talked about three different production functions back then. We did the Linear, the Leontief, and Cobb-Douglas. You might remember that when we changed the technology just between those three production functions, behavior changed radically. In the Linear production function, firms only used one input or the other, whereas in Cobb-Douglas they always did some kind of mix. And then in Leontief, they took it to the other extreme, where the mix was always exactly the same. Beyond that, we can look at certain industries are more labor-intensive versus capital-intensive. If we look at the Cobb-Douglas, that's just going to affect the relative size of those exponents on K&L. With the Leontief, it's going to be affected by the, the size of the coefficients. Some industries have technology that gives us economies of scale, and some gives us diseconomies of scale. Certain industries have technology that is most effective when a huge amount of output is being produced, and that's what we would get in economies of scale. Whereas other industries function more effectively when the businesses remain small. We can also examine within a given industry when one firm has more advanced technology than the other. The result of that is one firm has a better cost function than the other. So the question is, how does that fundamental aspect of these firms affect how they behave and affect how the ultimate outcome and how does that affect the ultimate outcome in the market? Another important consideration to think about is the demand function. Firms of any kinds, whether they're monopolies, oligopolies, in a perfect competition, have to think about demand. Is it a high demand market? Is it a low demand market? How easily can consumers get information this is an interesting one because at one time people had to rely on newspaper ads or TV ads and now it's very easy to shop around on the internet. When information is highly accessible that can make the market more competitive because there's more of an advantage to competing on price. Whereas when consumers do not find it easy to shop around then firms can get away with charging higher prices. We recall all the way back to week four, we talked about price elasticity of demand. Remember that as the amount of accessible substitutes for a good increases, the more elastic it is. The reason for that is that when there are lots of substitutes available, if the price goes up, it's very easy to just switch over and consume something else instead. Whereas when you are looking at a good that has very few alternatives, the demand is generally quite inelastic because even if the price goes up, you're kind of just stuck with that good. Either buy it or don't buy it. There's just not a lot of options. A good example of this principle is to look at specific brands within a product category and think about the elasticity for those individual brands and then compare that to the elasticity of that product group in general. For example, we could look at the elasticity for Mountain Dew, and in fact, Mountain Dew's demand is highly price elastic, meaning that if the price goes up, there's a ton of different options of other drinks people could take instead. On the other hand, if we look at the market for all drinks as a group, that's not very elastic at all because we have to drink something. There isn't any other product group that fulfills the same purpose as drinks. We can put these two concepts together into the Rothschild Index. The Rothschild Index is a comparison of the overall elasticity of a product group to the elasticity of a single firm's product or a single brand. The way that we do this is by dividing the elasticity for the whole product group by the elasticity of the individual firm. Remember that the firm's elasticity is always going to be bigger than the whole product group's elasticity because there's always more substitutes for an individual brand than there is for the whole category. 
What this means is that the Rothschild index is always between 0 and 1. These elasticities are always negative. So a negative divided by a negative is always a positive, so it can't be less than 0. And it also can't be greater than 1 because elasticity for the individual firm is always bigger. How can we apply the Rothschild index to thinking about market structure? In highly competitive industries, the elasticity of an individual firm is very, very high. Why is that? Well, in highly competitive industries, if one firm raises the price, you simply switch to their competitor. As such, they're going to have a very high elasticity. But that doesn't mean that the product group as a whole is elastic, just that the individual firm's demand is elastic. When elasticity in the denominator is very, very high, the Rothschild index R is close to zero, whereas in industries where individual brand loyalty is very, very strong, if the price of your preferred brand goes up, you're probably going to just keep buying that as it's really the only brand you tend to think about. In those cases, R can be pretty close to one. Let's go through a few examples here. Let's look at those first two entries in the table food and tobacco. In the first column, I've got the elasticity of food and tobacco in general. And then in our EF column here, I've got the elasticity for a typical firm within that category. So this would be the elasticity here of, say, Marlboro. Whereas this number right here is the elasticity of tobacco products in general. Let's calculate the Rothschild index here. So all we need to do is divide the product category elasticity by the individual firm elasticity. As you can see, all the numbers are negative, so the Rothschild index is always going to be a positive number. What this means here is that the whole food industry's elasticity is about 26% of a typical firm's elasticity. Now let's compare that with tobacco. I'm going to take the industry elasticity, divide that by the firm elasticity, and you can see here, of course, they're the same, so we get one. A typical tobacco firm has about the same elasticity of demand as tobacco products on a whole. This suggests that tobacco products have a very high brand loyalty. Most people just always buy the same brand of cigarettes, even if the price goes up. Food, on the other hand, has much weaker loyalty like that. If the price of one brand of chips goes up, people are generally happy to just buy the cheaper one. Another factor that we can think about is that food is an incredibly broad category. There's all kinds of things in there that we can substitute between. If we compare that to food in general, there aren't really alternatives to food. So we should expect the firm level elasticity to be much bigger than the food elasticity as a whole, and in fact, that does happen. The last market structure concept that we need to think about is how easy is it to actually enter the market? We use the term barriers to entry to, to describe any obstacles that are going to raise the opportunity cost of entering an industry. Barriers to entry can come in a variety of different forms. Sometimes it's simply large capital requirements. To get into a certain industry, sometimes you need to buy really expensive equipment. Even something like, say, photography as an industry has some barriers to entry because to be a professional photographer, you're going to need to get a very high quality camera. You're going to have to set up a studio and you might have to pick up some expensive photo editing software as well. Thinking about a grander scale of industry, you might think about the auto industry where there's a lot of machinery that's required to get set up there. Additionally, there's a lot of work that has to go into the auto industry in terms of sourcing parts and building those relationships with all the different suppliers. That's going to be pretty expensive, and it's going to constitute a barrier to entry to that industry. And as we well know, there's not been very many entrants into the auto industry in the last few decades. Now, large capital requirements are a barrier to entry mostly on a practicality side, whereas Patents are actually a legal barrier to entry. Patents prevent the use of a particular innovation for a fixed amount of time. 
Patents are very important in the pharmaceutical industry, for example, where different firms race to get a patent for a particular drug. And once that patent is reached by one of those firms, everybody else is locked out. Finally, we might think about economies of scale. Remember that economies of scale happen when large amount of output lowers the average cost. And in some cases, the initial capital investment required might be so big that we need economies of scale just to become profitable. And that's going to make it really hard for a new small firm to break into the industry because they're, they're going to need to ramp up production to a huge amount to even remotely compete with the existing large firms in the market. And that wraps up our discussion of structure. In the next video, I'm going to talk about conduct and performance.